You're listening to Voces Críticas, Critical Voices. I am your producer and host, Silvana Falcón. Today, I'm here with Dr. Michelle Tellez, Assistant Professor of Mexican-American Studies at the University of Arizona. For over 20 years, Dr. Tellez has been committed to exploring shared human experiences and advancing social justice. An interdisciplinary scholar trained in sociology, Chicano-Chicano studies, community studies, and education, her work seeks to uncover stories of identity, transnational community formation, gendered migration, resistance, and Chicana mothering. Dr. Theus has published in several book anthologies and in journals such as Gender and Society, Feminist Formations, Aslan, and Chicana Latina Studies, and in online outlets such as Feminist Wire and Truth Out. She also uses visual media to engage and share these stories. Her last video, Workers on the Rise, is from 2012, and it documents labor struggles in Maricopa County, Arizona. Welcome, Shell, to Voces Críticas. Thanks for having me. Happy it's to fun be to here. have you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let's just sort of literally start off with a very simple question of how are you? And I really mean like, how are you? And not in that kind of way that we say, oh, I'm fine. But like, really, how are you doing? Well, I'm happy to be here with you. And I think that these little moments are those that bring us the joy to get us, sustain us through some of these really difficult times. But I always think about Hakim Bey. He wrote a book called Temporary Autonomous Zones about how we can create these spaces temporarily outside of the system, I guess. And we can define that in many ways as a way to have control or have some form of joy and creation and mutuality. Being here with you is amazing. And I am doing okay. I also think that we've been in this for a long time. I've been living in Arizona for 13 years and things have been difficult for a little while. And I think if we look at the arc of history, this is also true. But we've also found ways to continue to find joy, to continue to resist, to continue to create. And I always talk about how when in my 20s, I was at a meeting around Zapatismo and an elder said, No hay que luchar para destruir, hay que luchar para crear. I mean, we mustn't struggle just to destroy, we must struggle to create. And so that's sort of like my mantra in my life to think about, yes, there's always going to be a problem that we need to resolve and how can we creatively resist and be in community with each other. Um, that's not to say that this moment isn't acute. And the things that are happening along our southern borders, we're here in Northern California and there's fires raging around us. There's a loss. There's people's homes that have been damaged or completely lost. And so not to dissuade from the reality and the precarity of our lives, but also to just recognize that to have this moment in this space and these conversations is really important. So I'm okay. I'm okay. Considering, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, and I hear you on that because I think it is easy to fall into missing the moments of joy that can exist, whether it's, you know, our coming together today was sort of just quick text. And so I think trying to remember that we need that joy actually to keep going because oftentimes, you know, you can fall into a little bit of a black hole because I think the onslaught of the news is every day. I think I wake up going, what's happened now? Whereas months where every day was like breaking news, breaking news. And I'm like, how much more are we going to get of this? And I also think like as a mother, I think about my daughter's future and I think about all the children's future. And so there's something about like avoidance, maybe <laughs> just taking a little breather because otherwise it can just feel all overwhelming. So I think it's important to do that. Yeah, very overwhelming. So you live in Arizona, 13 years, which is really hard to believe. We had some interesting election results, uh -huh. you know, coming out of Arizona. And so... Do you feel like there's a new Arizona on the horizon? Do you feel it's just more of the same? Is something shifting there? What is your kind of read of the politics of Arizona, especially when we think about questions of migration, where it's been such a battlefield? Yeah, no, I think it's an important question. And I do think people are looking towards Arizona. I think Arizona is unique. When I first arrived there in 2006, when the, their massive pro-migration protests started happening around the country, I thought about that moment, and I think about where we're at now, it's a complete shift. I, I feel that Arizona often gets seen as this place where all these bad things happen, and it's frustrating as somebody who's living there to see all of the people who are actually doing amazing work, building community, resisting culturally, politically, creating new spaces, right? And so I think that the electoral politics are important we know this, right? We've seen this when there was this big battleground between even the presidents two years ago and people thought, well, 
they're one and the same, you know, these arguments. And we realize that the policies that can be enacted can be harsh and severe and affect the lives of, of many people. And so when you're speaking from a position of privilege, you cannot ignore that. And so I think that in Arizona, some th interesting things have happened with these recent elections. Of course, we have Kirsten Cinema representing the state at the Senate level. I've known her. I knew her when she was a graduate student at ASU and she was finishing her PhD and she started getting into politics and was really one of the people that helped get some of the major spaces for some of those protests that we were doing around SB 1070, HB 2281. She's evolved in her career in different ways. I think something is there. The fact that she's a woman, there's something there, right? That's important. I think that in the state, there's also a superintendent, Kathy Hoffman, that just got voted in. With HB 2021 in 2010, we lost the program for Mexican-American studies at the K-12 through system. So we know that these people have power and influence the ways in which we can educate our children, the ways in which we can teach, the ways in which we can live and move freely within the city or within the counties. And so I think that's huge. There's been a battleground in Arizona and part of the national movement of Red for Ed, but there's also been a Save Our Schools movement against the charter and the privatization of education. So I think Kathy Hoffman is a big win for the state in that regard. And then, of course, in the House of Representatives, we have somebody that I used to work with and organize with at the Worker Center, Raquel Teran, who was voted in to represent her district. And the day after she won, she was met with a lawsuit from a local uh, citizen who was contesting her citizenship. Wow. Yeah. So instead of celebrating her victory, then she had to gather a team of lawyers to go to court and to prove that she indeed was born in Douglas, Arizona, and is a U.S. citizen and can represent the state of Arizona, the Arizona legislature. So, you know, it's a mixed bag. I think there's a lot of potential. The people that I see and work with every day are building towards a better humanity. There's so many organizations that have been doing this work. So you can't take it just as the electoral politics. You have to look at all the work that's been happening on the ground. Derechos Humanos, Dona Tierra, Puente Human Rights, uh, Trans Queer Pueblo, Mariposa Sin Frontera. I mean, there's so many groups that have been doing really important work over the last 12 years that I think made this moment possible. And all the people that were canvassing and making sure that people were registered to vote. So there is potential there. And I think that if I can see what has happened in Arizona and think about it nationally, I think that there is still a lot of potential for transformation and that we can still imagine a future where we are speaking against the racism and the patriarchy and the sexism that's coming down from the executive level. From all over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, from all over. Yeah. I mean, that's really important because I think we can quickly lose sight of the community work that's being done because they're not getting the kind of airplay that m the more egregious and offensive stuff like, you know, where I was going to ask you too about your reaction to the pardon of Arpaio, which was, you know, all over the news and rightfully so. I mean, I felt like there was that moment where like, okay, he's going to finally be held accountable. And of course that all was upended. So what did you think when Arpaio got pardoned? I'm sure you thought like I did. But. <laughs> I mean, I think it's a lot of it and it was largely symbolic. I mean, all of it. Very painful, though. I mean, I, I had to see so many families affected by what he was doing to our communities. Families, I mean, before we understood family separation at the border, there was family separation happening across Maricopa County, across Arizona and different communities, raids, trauma. There's lots of family stories that we could talk about. So a lot of rage. And, you know, when he lost the election in 2016, I thought Trump's going to do something for him. I just assumed that that was going to happen because, I, like I said, I think it's a ploy, it's a tactic to appease particular folks. But I think overall, what happened in Arizona during, you know, those eight years of trying to get Arpaio out is that it helped build these responses in these communities. A lot of those young children that were affected by their families being taken away from their places of employment, car washes, you know, restaurants, watching it on television as their parents are being taken away. They actually recognize that they have a voice and you have young people going to present their cases and congressional hearings to let them know what was happening in the state of Arizona. Anyway, so I feel like it was a disappointment, but not a surprise, not a surprise. And that rage that you have, I think I just move it towards the energy of those young people that are responding in different ways. I was a little surprised. I was like, I wasn't. oh, really? Yeah. See, mm -mm. that's interesting because I'm like, Arpaio, he's back in the news like Arpaio. Mm -mm. He, how did he suddenly become the first, right? The first one to get the pardon. Definitely was red meat for the base, but I thought 
he would pick someone else. I'm not quite sure. But anyways, I was like, oh my gosh, Arpaio is back in the news. I thought that nightmare was gone and it it clearly wasn't. But this is, I think, your point about why the electoral process can matter. Our good friend, Molly Talcott, when I had her on the show and shout out to Molly, so she's listening. One of the things that we talked about was that what electoral politics can do for us in terms of resistance is thinking about who gets elected as establishing or setting up the context for organizing. And so we should right. be asking ourselves, do we want to organize around this person in office or that person in office? Because either way, you're organizing. Mm-hmm. And so what are the conditions in which you Absolutely. prefer to do that? And so she said, when I thought about that as my sort of rubric for voting, it wasn't necessarily that I was a huge Clinton supporter, but I would much rather be organizing under her administration, knowing that in either case, I'd have to be organizing than this. Absolutely. And so I think Arizona is interesting because if we think about the context for organizing has potentially opened up new avenues in a way that haven't been there in quite a while. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're listening to Dr. Michelle Tejas, Assistant Professor of Mexican-American Studies at the University of Arizona. Dr. Tejas is an interdisciplinary scholar trained in sociology, Chicano studies, Chicana studies, community studies and education and her work seeks to uncover stories of identity, transnational community formation, gendered migration, resistance and uh, Chicana mothering. Can we talk a little bit more about the creative work that you're seeing and witnessing? The creative work brings a different kind of joy and is fundamental to any kind of resistance. So how are you seeing that kind of creativity being the other piece to the resistance? So I've been in Tucson now for two years. I was in Phoenix for several years. So I'll talk specifically, I guess, about my last two years, because that's essentially where I've been. And I think that one project that I'm really proud to be a part of and to see it sort of grow from this little seed, it's called the Binational Arts Residency. This project really came together out of conversations with several women, women women-led, mostly women of color-led. And I think that's even what we're seeing like nationally who's leading some of the the changes that are happening at the federal level and the government. So the National Arts Residency is one where we collaborate across the state and we bring artists to Arizona to work with local artists who are already doing the work of building community, of responding to the conditions in which they find themselves, thinking about their landscapes, whether it's social, political, physical. And so they could be visual artists, they can be performing artists, they could be dancers. And so then they workshop with local organizations, activist groups, they come to the universities. So we do this whole thing. And then there's several like culminating experiences. One happens along the border and between Douglas and Agua Prieta. And those are really phenomenal because you actually see literally the border wall separating these artists who are trying to be in conversation with one another across the wall through their spirits, their movements, you know, whatever it is that they're doing. But also, I think throughout the residency, when they interact with local communities, it's really important to see sort of the shifts and the exchanges that are happening. And also to, you know, really like humanize Arizona, because oftentimes people think of Arizona as something that's the anomaly. And I always have to push back and remind folks, actually, that this is the, the roots of this country. And so because we're living it differently, or we've been living it differently in Arizona. Now, guess what? Everyone's sort of seeing the realities that we've been responding to. So I feel like we're actually better equipped to produce that joy and to produce those creative spaces. Another group that I am really proud to have worked alongside with is a theater company called Borderlands Theater. And they've been around for at least 30 years. It was a theater that was created by Barclay Goldsmith and now being run and directed by Mark David Pinate and Milta Ortiz. And what I love about the work that they do is their work is really ethnographic, actually. And a couple of their recent projects are about barrio stories, basically visualizing and putting on stage the histories of many Mexicano urban communities of color in Tucson that have been ignored. Don't We don't know about them. My class actually was able to collaborate with their recent staging of a barrio story, Barrio Anita. And it was an amazing project. I mean, I was blown away because they do visual and they tell these stories of these residents who have been displaced by urbanization and they replicate what it might have looked like in that time period. 
and they had this whole scene where you could walk through this neighborhood and they were playing music and they had like an open fire and food. Anyway, it was just, it was really beautiful. And I was lucky that my university level students who, you know, may not be from Tucson, who don't know anything about the border, but what they hear on the radio or what they hear on the television. And so then to know that we're not just a place that people pass through, we're a place that we live in. This is our community. These are our residences, these are our histories. And so I think Borderlands Theater is doing a, a wonderful job with that. And then I I'm learning how to play the harana. I know. I'm so glad you're <laughs> going to talk about that. And so that has been really fun for me. That's really one of my spaces of joy. I mean, I suck. Well, you know, I'm not going to say that anymore about myself, but I... Don't be too hard on yourself. <laughs> I love it. We started the Son Harocho Collective in Arizona as one of the co-founders. First started up in Phoenix, and when I moved to Tucson, we were able to keep the project going, and we had our first ever Fandango in the fall of 2017 at the Sosa Carrillo House, and it's important that we had it there because this is one of the spaces that was an old Mexican neighborhood that my colleague Lidia Otero writes about in her book La Calle, and this neighborhood was born bulldozed in the 60s because they wanted to build the convention center and the only reason this one house survived was because it had some connection to a governor Fremont. anyways had some anglo connections otherwise the mix this old adobe cedar roof house would have been demolished but anyways we held our first fandango there and it was beautiful i mean the, the structure is still intact and to bring back you know this music i think was really uplifting and really powerful and it was i mean fandango and son harocho was really about community building so that's something that i try to do there in, in tucson with this project i'm also involved in this collective called the chicana mother Work collective and we have this anthology coming out but also we do podcasting and blogs so that people can tell their stories in different spaces not just in academic spaces and so i think there's ways in which we can speak across areas so that we're reaching people that we want to reach but also be in conversation with each other across these spaces so great that's why i do this show we need to be in conversation with people that are just not tied to the academy so tell us about chicana mother work and the book and why that was important to do you know, I was just talking about this. I was at a conference last weekend called the National Women's Studies Association Conference and the American Studies Association Conference. It was a double whammy and lots of folks that I've been in conversation with for several years. I'm lucky that there are lots of people that I know who are committed to transforming not only academic spaces, but they really imagine a better world. And so with these people, I remember when I shared the first piece that I had ever written about Chicana mothering. And I was at a conference in Oregon where my daughter, who was nine months old, was literally floating in the audience between arms of people who were supporting that day. That was a, the future of minority studies. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, Michelle and I go way back. <laughs> oh, way, even before that. <laughs> so anyway, I say that because it was like a powerful moment for me to finally be able to speak back to some of the injustices that I had experienced as a mother, as a single mother, as a woman of color in the academy. Well, actually, I stopped writing for about it for a little while. It was, it's painful. Sometimes the writing is painful and sometimes what we see in the world is too painful to even think about. So I think we do take a step away anyway. And so once... I kept developing this idea of Chicana mother work in a couple of pieces. And then I wrote a piece in Feminist Formations that got a little bit more attention. And I had some graduate students reach out to me and we decided that we wanted to start collaborating. And it was just simply like, hey, we, we should write an article together. Okay, we should do a conference presentation together. Okay, you know, we should really do a podcast together and start telling our stories. We have hundreds of listeners now. And then we decided we should develop an anthology and... We put out a call for papers and we only gave folks like maybe two months to respond. And within that time frame, we had like over 88 um, submissions, which, you know, for this little grassroots group, we didn't know who was going to even read the call for papers. And we had to get that down to 18 chapters. That's when we decided, well, we should start publishing some of these stories online. So we developed a blog online and now we edit a blog online called Chicana Mother Work. So Chicana Mother Work and what's the website? chicanamotherwork.com so chicanamotherwork.com well Michelle thank you so much for coming on the show if you believe it we're out of time <laughs> no. I told you it goes fast it goes you're fast you're amazing thank you thank you profe. so much <laughs>